Good evening, everyone. My name is Solimar Salas, and I'm the Vice President for Content Innovation and Outreach at the Museum of Latin American Art. My pronouns are she, her, ella, and I recognize that I live and work on the traditional and sacred lands of the Tongva, Kitsch, Akshumen, and Chumash, and many other indigenous groups who call these grounds home. I honor and extend my gratitude to all of the original people still living in this region. Thank you for joining us today, Wednesday, September 20th, 2023, as we begin a new session of GRIT, Generating Radical Inclusion and Transformation. This series of conversations explores how GRIT, an attribute often given to people who overcome obstacles, can serve as a tool to build agency with a specific focus on creative expression. GRIT seeks to expand what it means to practice art for social change. Support for the interpretive programming at MOLA is provided by the Miller Foundation, Dwight Stewart Youth Fund, Arts Council for Long Beach, Robert Gunbiner Foundation, and the City of Long Beach. Special thanks to the California Arts Council Arts Exposure Grant for their generous two-year support. Today's conversation is facilitated by and hosted by Glicela Suarez. She is a writer, artist, cook, and a teacher. She was born in unincorporated East Los Angeles and walked Whittier Boulevard and Brooklyn Avenue in black and white saddle shoes. She grew up in a place where her thoughts did not really find a voice. Instead, she found a pen and paper. Her hometown inspires her to investigate memories of a home space that continues to be bodiless. She believes that the arts are essential in empowering others to express their thoughts. Mm -hmm. Through her career, she has created programming and training dedicated to facilitating transformation and creating agency for her communities. Today's guest is Dr. Or Dr. Maricela Becerra, she, her, ella, and she is a first-generation student and an immigrant. She graduated from UCLA Department of Spanish and Portuguese in 2019 with a PhD in Hispanic Languages and Literatures. She joined the Spanish program at CSU Channel Islands in 2020 as an assistant professor. Prior to her doctoral studies, Dr. Becerra received a master's degree in Spanish literature and a BA in Spanish literature. Chicano, study, Chicano Latino Studies and the Political Science from the California State University, Long Beach. Dr. Becerra's scholarship focuses on interdisciplinary analysis of state violence, trauma, and memory in Latin America. She mm -hmm. specializes in contemporary Mexican social movements and memories as resistance in cultural production. Her current project explores social media as an organizing tool in the contemporary feminist uprisings in Mexico by looking at the role of hashtags in denouncing femi feminicidios and digital memorials as resistance. Dr. Becerra began sharing her journey as a Latina mom in higher education in 2016 through the blog and social media account, Academic Mami. She hopes to demystify higher education for other Latines and advocates for parenting and stu parenting students. As we begin our program, please remember to drop any questions into the Q&A window or the chat, and we'll be monitoring both. At the button, buttons can be found at the bottom of your screen. I will be monitoring the time and responding to the comments during the conversation. All Q and A's will happen then at the end. And with that, thank you both for being here with us, Grisela. It's all yours. Muchas gracias, Solimar. Uh, thank you, the Museum of Latin American Art, for hosting this tonight and continuing this program of grit that allows me to welcome. Um, home to Long Beach. Um, fabulous guests like um, Dr. Maricela de Serra Garcia. Such wonderful, so wonderful to have you. Um, and so uh, tonight, our attendees, our guests, thank you so much for joining us and for being part of this conversation. Um, we are here to share stories. Um, insights in a very informal manner. And um, we do welcome you to engage with our guests, ask questions, um, and know that we are here to not only share what we have gone through, but also provide any tools uh, that can help your journey. So with that, um, buenas noches y bienvenida, Maricela. Hi, muchas gracias. I'm so happy to be back virtually in Long Beach. I, I love Long Beach so much. Yes, and go beach. Go, go beach. beach. <laughs> um, and so let's let's start with um, a topic that actually you and I have done many times just in on our offices or hanging out and having lunch or whatever. Like, how did you cultivate your voice, right? Who helped you find 
your voice and and um why is it so important for you to continue mm -hmm. cultivating and speaking out that is such a great question that i've been thinking about for a while actually because i'm an immigrant so i came to the us when i was 12 and i didn't know how to speak english so my first years i feel like i didn't have a voice i couldn't communicate you know at school with my peers only at home um you know or with someone who spoke spanish but i me sentí como muda like i just couldn't talk for a long time mm -hmm. and i think it has taken me a while to be comfortable with my voice first in english and then sharing it with the world mm -hmm. so i don't think i have like a specific moment that i can say oh that's when i like I discovered my voice, but I can see different moments throughout my life, people encouraging me to use my voice and to tell me that I had something to say that was valuable. Mm -hmm. Of course, like my high school career, my college career, my, my graduate career as well. But um, I think now that I'm a professor and then like I see myself speaking in front of a whole room full of people, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this. Before mm -hmm. I will be probably crying if I had to do that in front of a classroom, right? Um, and at the same time, being comfortable with sharing my story. Mm -hmm. I was also undocumented for a while. So there is some sort of fear of what you're going to share about your life, right? And how you're going to use your voice. So it has taken me a while to be comfortable. But I'm also thankful to have wonderful role models that encouraged me to use my voice and to keep sharing my story. And that gave me a space and let, and let me know that it was okay for me to take the space, but also create my own spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, from what I know about you, those spaces happen within family space, right? Educational mm -hmm. space. Um, and even in social media, the virtual, the, 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 the internet, right? Like the, that region. And so um, do you, navigate those all differently do they require a different maricela a different voice oh absolutely absolutely um i think it's you know like i'm required to be different i think in each space as well but for example as as a student i enjoyed being a student and i enjoyed writing essays and sharing my the stories of my family specifically uh like memories of my family of growing up because i don't think i can share those things at home because once you share like family stories at home, then it becomes like everybody's story, right? And everybody's like correcting you or telling you that's not what you're supposed to say, or is like the whole saying of los trapos se lavan en casa, like you're not supposed to say our stories to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I think there are certain things that I can say in spaces outside of my home or, or outside my family space. Um, yeah. and, I, and what I've been doing lately is I've been listening in family spaces. So I love being around my, like my tias and my grandma mm -hmm. and just hearing them go back and forth. And I'm just like getting everything that they're saying, right? And trying to remember everything. Um, so at, at that space, I'm the listener right now. One day when I'm older, when I'm like, I don't want to call myself a señora. When I'm like more of a señora, maybe like a doña, then maybe <laughs> I'll have like okay. a speaking role. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't it's think true. I'm... You know how, like, it's interesting because for a, for a long time, I wasn't even invited to the table where my tias talk. Mm -hmm. It was like, you're like on the side because you're eres una niña, you're not supposed to be hearing these things. And now like I have a place at the table, but I don't think I'm allowed to speak yet. That is so true. I, uh, that is so true. And I see it in, in many ways unspoken, but we all know it, right? And um, there's a, 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 a file, a fila of chairs on the side. And you know what, that's your chair versus the table with, with the tias and the madrinas and the comadres, right? That is so true. Um, and the role of listener um, is as important as the, the speaker, because mm -hmm. as a role of listener, you're there to take on the stories, pass on the stories, learn from the stories. Um, we have a few students from Long Beach State here tonight, and I don't know if you've read um, Ocean Vong um, in uh -huh. his his literature. He's a Vietnamese um, immigrant American writer, 
and we read his essay, um, which is titled uh, Immigrating into English. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of his stories, one of the, his anecdotes is that he listens and watches his grandmother, right? And that was his Vietnamese side. Um, and on, and uh, you find it, it's a really great essay. <laughs> I don't want to get into it right now, but yeah, we all have in, in, in that immigration experience is in some ways in those little moments, connections, mm-hmm. right? We listen to our elders, we, we watch and listen how, what they're doing, right? Um, yeah. What about in, uh, on the internet, on, on social media? I know that um, your, your influencer handle of academic mommy has been around for some time, right? This is not something new, right? When did you first start it? Maybe as no. a blog. I, I I like to I like to um claim this. I was one of the first Latina higher education Instagram accounts out there in 2016. Um and like now there's a bunch of them and I'm like, oh that's amazing. I didn't have that. So I created that space for myself. Mm-hmm. And it came sort of as um como, like an act of resistance. So I was getting my PhD and my master's was hard as a mom in academia. So I had my my oldest, who is now he's 13 now, he's a teenager. But back then I had my oldest when I was an undergrad, actually, my last semester of undergrad. So throughout my master's, I was a mom. And it was a very isolating experience. It was just like, at first I thought that I had to hide my motherhood to be successful in my program. And I did for a while. And then when I got to my PhD, I encountered some professors who were not welcoming to parenting students. And I just needed an outlet. I needed to create a space for myself and to have that voice of sharing my experience without judgment. And that's when I started Academic Mommy. Not, I didn't have a plan. Like I don't consider myself an influencer or anything. It was just me sharing my day, like sharing like me walking my kids to school and taking the bus to class, right? Mm-hmm. Or waking up at five in the morning to do homework with my kid by my side. And it took a while for people to find out, people from school, people from my PhD, to find out that I had an Instagram account because I wouldn't share that. That was like my thing. I didn't want it to be part of who I was in the PhD program. Um, I don't, I don't know why. Just maybe because I was like talking things about people that I didn't want them to know. No sé, no sé por qué lo lo oculté, <laughs> pero I didn't want them to find out until later on. But it became sort of this safe space for me to just share my journey without really an agenda in mind, just me sharing my day to day. And then it became like a bigger thing. Um, and then now I think I, I, I don't follow like the whole higher education content down to the T, like now I just share whatever I want and whenever I want. Mm-hmm. Because back in the day, like I was conscious about growing my brand and branding your Instagram and you know, all that thing. And I did it like a schedule of content that will create content specifically for it. Mm -hmm. So it became like this very curated space as well. And I always let people know that like, what what are you seeing here? This little square in the caption, that's very curated. Like I'm I'm giving you a version of myself that I want you to have. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that you know everything about me. And I was very transparent about that. You know that you you're you're only getting what I'm what I'm giving you. I'm not allowing you to have everything that comes from me, because mm-hmm. that was also important to me to protect some sort of like what I had inside and not just share everything freely. Um, and yeah, it 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 really I think it helped me finish my PhD. It that space really helped me. It held me accountable when I was writing my dissertation. Um, and the most beautiful thing happened when I graduated because everybody that saw my entire journey was celebrating that I had graduated. And that's when I noticed like, oh my gosh, like that person started following me when I first started my account and now they're celebrating my graduation with me. So it became so sort of like a comunidad outside of my mm-hmm. university that was much needed for my journey at that time. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's a... Um, I think I would say yes, there's a little fear when you're have this handle, you have this profile and you're sharing your thoughts. I can see why you would not share it in your academic circles. I can totally see that. And I think um you were protecting yourself in many ways, yeah. right? You were protecting yourself and knowing all the challenges you've had to overcome. 
um, it's okay to have that space for yourself. Uh, and, and oftentimes it's not given to us or made for us. So then we become very protective of it. Mm-hmm. I, I go, I, I want to make sure this is the state remains mine. Okay. Is, is mio completo. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it can also be used as a tool of promotion by a university or look at our students, look what they're doing, you know? And so you have kept it very protected. Congratulations. Thank I, you. Well, n- now it's it's funny because my students Google me, so it comes up, and then they go, "I'm following you," and then I go, "Well, I might say something about your class, just so you know." <laughs> that's yes, that's transparent, right? Because we 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 two teachers, maestras, profesoras, have our thoughts. <laughs> we have our mm-hmm. thoughts, right? Um, and so you made the transition also to TikTok, mm-hmm. um, and I I you know. Of course, I also follow you and 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 often um, with the TikTok medium, there's a lot of a, a possibility of reacting or sharing your thoughts on a particular matter. Um, is there one that you would like to share with us now? I know there was a recent Ventura situation. Um, hap- no, that was Santa Barbara, but there was, I think there was also a Ventura one. Anyway. Is there an issue that you think you reacted to that you felt was extremely important? You're like, I need to get on this right now. Hmm. And now I'm thinking, I'm like, which TikToks have I done recently? Okay. Um, a few, I think a few. Like I said, I'm very selective with my content. So it's not like I don't plan that ahead. Whenever I feel like it, I just turn on the camera and start talking. Um. Well, like I see like language is really important for you, right? You study Lang- language. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. So, you know, I think social media now can be used as well to share some things about our culture that might not be the best things to share, in my opinion, right? So the whole like no sabo kids, I dislike that term so much. I dislike that term so much. And I study languages. So when I make those videos, I'm trying to educate folks and saying, hey, this is actually contributing to our community not wanting to speak Spanish because you make fun of them. So let's work through this. Let's see what's behind this reason. Um, I'd, li- I'd like to share the story of Spanish in the US as well, because I don't think people know the history, the, the violent history of Spanish in this country. The fact that people were bitten at school for speaking Spanish until not that long ago, actually, like 50, 60 years. So we have that trauma, the language shaming trauma in this country that I don't think is being taken into account when we make videos making fun of Latinas speaking what they call broken Spanish. So Mm -hmm. that's the one thing that if I see it, I might react to it and have a fight with someone on TikTok that I don't know. Um, Just because I'm like, I'm going to defend, I'm going to defend this, you know. Yes. And, and so for some of our guests who may not know what is considered a no sabo kid is someone who could be first or second generation, right? Born in the U S and more like you can go through the generations and whose Spanish is, and there's so many words out there, right? Bocho, broken, mocho. Like there's all these words for like, it's not what is deemed proper or appropriate. Right. And so, um, but in their communities, they communicate like that all the time and everyone understands them. You know, exactly. so yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And there is a generation of, um, I would say, people in their late 50s, 60s, of um, however they identify, who just were told not to speak Spanish. Mm-hmm. There was, right. I, I agree that. Um, it wasn't their fault, right? Yeah. Um, again, everyone, feel free to start asking questions. You can use the Q&A um, as we move forward in the dialogue. All right, so I, like I mentioned, we have lots of students here tonight. Um, can you share a little bit, we talked about social media presence and uh-huh. your profile there, but can you share a little bit so that they learn like what you study and what you write about Mm -hmm. it's very heavy stuff and I like to just sort of like a warning to people Uh, I've been doing this work for a while so I think I cope with humor because of the heavy work that I do so if I make a joke or see me laughing it's because that's the way that I cope with 
these mm -hmm. things. Um, I researched state violence in Mexico, specifically massacres and feminicidios. And more specifically, the way that these are represented through cultural production and how this is creating memories of the events. Mm -hmm. So I look at the 1968 massacre in Mexico City and how it's being remembered by the younger generations. So people who were not there, but have read about it or maybe watched the movie and created something as a way of processing what they just witnessed secondhand, right? Um, and feminicidios, I'm looking at social media and how it's being used to create these wonderful and powerful movements online to denounce feminicidios um, in a country that only, that only, um, 2% of the feminicidio cases as are, are treated as such as feminicidios. So it is a tool that names the crime, names it feminicidio, gives a face to the woman, to the mujer, or to the niña sometimes, and um, creates a movement of support, of mourning, but also of memory making. And for me, the way that I see this um, violence in Mexico, I see memory as an act of resistance. And for memory to become an act of resistance, it has to be transmitted through different generations and different forms as well. So that's the that's in a nutshell, that's the thing that I look at. Um, but uh, my husband always makes fun of me because all my books are very depressing. He says because I read about you know death and literature, or you know feminicidios and mass graves and very dark stuff. But I think it's necessary. Um, I think that the whole point of this culture production around death in Mexico, los desaparecidos, las mujeres de Juarez, everything that has been created is an act of remembering these people. And by remembering them, we're not letting them take that away from us, the memory from us. And how are hashtags related to your research and, and what you study? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, Families may not get the attention that they deserve to get when a woman or a niña are, are killed in Mexico. So they create their own movement. And it all starts with a specific hashtag for the victim. So for example, hashtag Justicia para Devani Escobar, which was a recent one that I uh, researched. So the name itself of the mujer becomes their own movement online. So that hashtag is used throughout post and that's how you can track what's being shared about the case, but also how it's being remembered. Um, a lot of times you see pictures that are from their, you know, their dead body, but también you see mujeres creating these beautiful artistic representations of the mujeres that have been killed as a way to humanizing the, the victims, but also to remind people that, you know, there are more than just a number in the cases of feminicidio in Mexico. So I track those hashtags, the specific hashtags created for the cases and see also the different reasons why one hashtag may become viral and why another one didn't become viral. And you get issues with access to the internet, with class, with the age of the victim as well, the region that they're from in Mexico, all of those things, um, their level of education, this, their skin color also matters to see who actually gets the attention of the medium. Wow. I didn't, um, that's fascinating to me that you, you're tracking these hashtags and geo-mapping them, right? You're like mapping them. Wow, that's great. Um, you mentioned the like artistic cultural impact. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, what's one example that maybe students can then research on their own Google in regards to like how they produced a memory or an artistic memory? Mm -hmm. So Devani Escobar, I'm going to write her name in the chat. If you can just put her name, it'll come out everywhere. Um, we have what is what we think is her last picture alive. So she was in an Uber. Um, and she didn't feel safe in the Uber, so she got out of the car. And the driver took the picture of her standing by the road to prove that he left her there, that it wasn't, you know, if something happens to her, it wasn't me. Sort of like an alibi for the driver. And that last picture became a symbol of the dangers of being a woman in Mexico because every woman in the country saw that picture and saw, saw themselves on that picture and felt the fear of being alone, right? And... Davani Escobar, I think I did, I did write it on the chat. 
And that last picture has been taken by different artists and has been recreated. So through painting, embroidery as well, um, they've done pieces out of it, murals as well in Mexico. So that last picture has become something that symbolizes not only the case of the Bani, but the feminicidios in Mexico and the movements around it. Okay. Um, are, are the uh, pink crosses installations also part of that this kind of production? It kind of has moved away from the pink crosses. So I, I make a distinction between uh, what we call mother activism. So I'm thinking of the Mujeres de Juarez, the women of Juarez at the border in the 90s, late 90s. That's when you saw the moms coming to the streets, right, and, and um, shouting their daughter's names. And I called my social media activism research hermana activism because mm -hmm. they're not the moms they're, they're they're not the sisters but they're kind of like the same age they relate to the victim at the same level i will say so this hermana activism actually uses the color purple to denounce feminicidios and gender violence in mexico so purple has become sort of the color of the movement now um, there are two main movements in feminist activism in Mexico. The green one is pro-choice, pro-legal abortion in Mexico, and the purple one is against gender violence. So you will see a lot of times that when you when you see at the social media post of feminicidios, they all have some sort of like purple detail around it, because that's the way that you create a movement online by using the same elements over and over to make it all a cohesive movement. And if there was a short film of feature link film may be available on all these platforms that someone tonight could go, you know, watch on a streaming service. Do you have any suggestions? Oh yeah. Ruido, Noise and on F Netflix. And then Las Tres Muertes de Marisela Escobar is a documentary. I'm gonna write it that down. Can go, make sure to choose the everyone tab on Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I'm over here like typing and no one is getting my things. I copied the the other one you did. Gracias. <laughs> and I'm like, they're right on the chat. <laughs> See, okay. you, after years of teaching on like online through the pandemic, we and we're it. still we making this it. thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Ruido is um, it's a film about a woman who whose daughter is missing. So she starts going to all these groups of mujeres that are looking for their children, the disappeared children. Um, I say children because, you know, son sus hijitos, pero they're adults, most of them. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because they actually go to real um, groups of buscadoras. Buscadoras are groups of women in Mexico who go out every day to dig for bones to find their, their disappeared family members. So every day they're out there digging and looking for bones. So it's sort of like a fictional film part documentary because you also follow these activists, uh, mujeres in Mexico. Okay. Um, thank you for, for these sources and, and um, okay, we have some questions coming in already. This is great. Okay, I, I, I have one more question for you. So then mm -hmm. yeah. um, the guest questions. So um, thank you for, for sharing how this all really connects because I think um, sometimes, not all the times, you know, at least you know me as my approach in teaching writing or art history, there is connection to movement, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the social media presence, the artists designing certain things, um, the songs written, right? The, the, these are all um, cultural production made by activists. Mm -hmm. uh, by mujeres wanting to get the word out to you know have people find their voice, I I see it all really connected. Um, and your your work is in Mexico, mm -hmm. but this happens throughout Latin America. There's also movement here, right? And so there are moments in time when all these movements have joined in some way, shape, or form. You know, in in national, uh, international uh, capacities. Um, so thank you so much for your work. It's absolutely needed. Um, yes, it is dark and sad and depressing, but um, that is life, right? We have our joyous moments and we have our dark moments. So I really appreciate that you do this work. Um, you know, even tonight, you know, our guests have seen you from like moving through your journey as an immigrant undocumented student, 
your presence on social media, your research work. You talked a little bit about your family. Um, what would you share to young students, young professionals? Like what's what are some things you would share to let them know um, things, lessons or things that you would say, I would have wanted to know 10 years ago, the following. What would you uh -huh. say? That people will try to silence you. People will try to really take that voice away from you. And it happened with me as well, my, my second semester in the PhD program. Um, so I came into the PhD program and I said, I'm going to research this massacre that happened in Mexico. Like that was my proposal and I'm not changing my mind. <laughs> like that's the one thing that I want to do and I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. And there was a professor who didn't agree, I guess, with my decision. And I was walking around campus. I went to his office hours actually. And I had a book of the museum about the massacre. So I had just taken it out of the library and had a big book, you know, like a museum book, the huge ones that they have. So I carried my book, I went to his office hours, and then he goes, oh, so you're going to research the massacre? And I said, yeah, like, that's that's what I want to do. I want to focus on that. And then he said, no one cares about that anymore. Mm -hmm. If I was you, I don't think I will do that. You, will, you won't find a job. Um, because I'm very petty, I actually did my entire dissertation to prove to him <laughs> more than anything how in the 21st century the massacre is still being remembered. But that all came back because when I did my job interview at Channel Islands, where I work now, I did a presentation on the massacre, on the film on the, of the massacre, actually. And this one student who was watching my job talk raised her hand and said, my grandpa was there and he saw his nephew getting murdered. And then she started crying and broke down. And then we all were all crying, you know, during my job talk. And then that for me was like a full circle moment. Like you told me, this person told me that no one care about the massacre. And here I am six years later, seeing the student who is like maybe, maybe 20 years old being, you know, triggered to share this memory of her grandpa because of my work. So it does matter. And someone does remember the massacre. So don't let anyone take your voice away from you. Don't let anyone silence you, even if they try. It does matter. Every mm -hmm. little part matters. Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing that story. And I think um, that that is the, that it matters to you. It has to matter for some, to someone else. If it matters to you, there is someone else in this world that it matters to as well, because something hit you there, something physically you you had this physical emotion when you know with this incident with this event even though you didn't live it right yeah. it's going to hit other people as well and i'm really sorry you know yes i've been teaching at lamy tech for a long time yes you are also at a university but there are colleagues of ours that i'm like really you're going to tear really <laughs> down that way it happens but you know what, I, I think what you just said is really important because that's how sometimes I felt about social media because I was sharing my story and I will share like memories of my family sometimes or like my abuelita making sopa, for example. That's like one memory that I have that I share. That's people. popular right now. Yeah, it's like millions of people <laughs> watching that. But um, sometimes I will be like, who cares? Like who is reading these things? And, and who, who actually cares about what I have to say about my life? Like... I'm no one, right? Um, but then you get people saying, hey, you actually inspired me, right? Or just reading you having to work at 5 a.m. with your kid really helped me through what I was going through. Or that was really funny. I needed to laugh today. Or thank you for helping me remember my grandma, for example. Mm -hmm. So you never know who actually is going to relate to your story. Thank you. I mean, you, you've shown too many um first generation college going students that it is it is all very possible it's hard work right it is hard work we need to acknowledge that but it's all very possible to to do your journey your educational journey um i think that's also very valuable um so we're going to begin taking some questions from the audience i'm going to start with um i'm going to try to go in order here um Okay, one uh, a question from Cynthia Rios. What are maybe some other topics that you have spoken about, spoken out about, um, other than you know the no sabo language issue? What are some other topics that you have 
the one exactly. thing that always triggers a response, especially on TikTok, is when I use inclusive language in Spanish. So if I use the E, like for example, Latine, or the X, forget if I use the X is like all of the purists come to my TikTok. It's like they've been summoned and they'll go and fight about the X and tell me that uh, um, the Real Academia Española is going to like, I don't know, haunt me or something. And they try to tell me that I'm not speaking proper Spanish and all these things. Uh, so that's one thing that I go, first of all, language is always evolving, right? So language always changes. We don't speak Spanish. Well, I don't speak Spanish the way that it was spoken when the first um, grammar book of Castellano was created in, in 1492, right? Everything has evolved and Spanish changes too. So yeah, being inclusive in Spanish just triggers some people a lot. What, what is Latine? When, when do we use Latine? Um, I like to use Latine when I'm speaking Spanish. I, for me, the way that I've seen it is that when you use the X Latinx, it's for me, I don't know if it's true. That's how I've seen it. It's referring to US um, populations. So Latin American populations here in the US and Latina is more of like in general. So when you use the E, I see it as more like general, uh, but the E is easier to conjugate in Spanish. Although I have seen the X used in official ads by the Mexico City government in Mexico City. So even Mexico City is using the X. Wow. Don't let anyone tell you you cannot I use I know the that. X. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Um, thank you for, for explaining that a little bit. I think... Um, I think we have come to a point where sometimes people are even scared of using a term because I'm going to get it wrong. And I want to let people, Hey, it's okay. We all do. We all say, say it differently. We all do it differently. And you always learn something. You always learn something, no matter the term that you use. So just be open to yeah. the lesson if it comes toward yours, your way. Um, one of the comments that we had here, uh, you saw it in, um, I don't know if you can see it in the chat. It's from the mm -hmm. On Blackshire, um, mm -hmm. would you say that the specific event not only symbolizes the struggles women go through in Mexico, but also maybe the image put on men in Mexico as well, since he took the picture to prove he left her there and that Norham was done, that could also be like an act of defense? So I like that the movement kind of took that picture and instead of leaving it as the alibi that it was for the men in the case, took it as a symbol of resistance for the women. Uh, because it was meant as an alibi, as as protection, as, hey, like, I didn't do anything to this mujer, like, I left her there, this is my alibi. It was timestamped, he sent it to her, to her friends, you know, and everything. But the movement took that image and made it into a symbol of the resistance, of the fear, of the violence, of everything that they go through. So I think that's what happened through the movement, that they kind of changed the meaning of the, of the image. Okay. And so then one of our attendees, and it's, it, they're an anom anonymous, so I, I can't call out your name, but thank you for the question. Um, is the movement in Mexico only, essentially? No, it's all over the world. Uh, and we can see that with, uh, there was a very popular performance that went viral in 2019, like the last few months of 2019, I, I'm guessing, I can't remember exactly the date. Um, El Violador Eres Tú popular song by a Chilean group of uh, performance art artists. Um, and that was translated and sang all over the world, in Paris, in the US, in Germany. So that just shows how relatable the, the cases of gender violence are, unfortunately, right? And the lack of justice towards those cases as well. I'm focusing on Mexico just because that's my background and I would love to do everything, but I can't. So I have to just focus on one thing at a time. Have you worked with other scholars from um, co-authored or done you know, research with uh, other um, academics that do this research uh, in Latin America? Have you explored that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's 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 hard because I'm over here, so I I go you know once a year or so and try to connect. Uh, but conferences are great because that's when you get to know people and they tell you, hey, I'm doing this thing too. We should connect. Um, so I love going to conferences for that aspect, the collaborative, the collaborative aspect of it. Um, the next question goes back to your educational journey. Was it difficult to pursue a master's degree while being a mother? I know we touched a little bit of we touched on it a little bit. 
you mentioned you didn't want to necessarily disclose that you were um, a mom, a parent. With um, how difficult was that for you? Very difficult. Um, well, I think just just being a mom is hard. My daughter says being a mom is very hard. I don't want to be a mom. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm giving you that impression. Um, it's hard, but I think it's harder when you don't have the support. So when I was a student at Long Beach State, they did not have support for parenting students. And I'm talking about both my undergrad experience and my grad experience, right? Now they do. Now they have a group of people fighting for rights, rights of the parenting students. Back then they didn't. Um, so it was hard. And I think I also made it harder on myself because I thought that I had to overproduce right and overachieve because I had something to prove of myself maybe and I will get to campus at 7 30 a.m every morning to get the good parking first of all and second to work so I will get there at 7 30 as a master's student I was teaching too during that time at Long Beach State so I will have a class like around 8 or 9 a.m teach my class and then my classes didn't start until like 6 or 7 p.m so I will be there all day working right get out of class at 10 get to the house at 10 30 my kid was asleep by then like I wouldn't see him um and that also changed me one day because he was three I remember clearly he was three years old he was dancing he loved dancing back then and he said mommy you never look at me when I'm dancing you're always doing homework I want you to look at me and that's when I was like, baby, I am going to look at you and put my books away. And I think my my priorities shifted in that moment. And now, like, my family is my priority. So during my PhD, it became easier because I was unapologetically a mom, right? And I said it. I was like, I'm not going to that event because at 7 p.m. and I have bedtime. Or I'm not going to that conference because you're not offering child care. Or you're not getting priority to register for your class, so I can't make it. You know, it was just, I was just me saying these things that I never said before. If I would be like, oh, I can make it. Don't worry, I can make it work. Oh yeah, don't worry, I'll figure it out. But then I was like, nope, like I have to be home every night to kiss my baby goodnight, for example. You know, and that to me became probably the one thing that really saved me from losing myself in academia. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think you, um, you know, there, there, I, I love Audre Lorde, right? And I think of so many quotes when these, in, these instances where it's like all about, you know, taking care of ourselves as part of the movement, yeah. right? Um, we need new tools all the time because the tools are what's going to change the world. The new tools are going to change the world. Um, and so thank you for, for doing that. I think for me as well, just protecting my, my family time, my time is important. I've also, we've also had to learn that the hard way. Yeah. I think it is very common with uh, first generation college going students, immigrant children. Um, when we see how our parents or our family members work because of their immigration status and how they have to work, that then we translate that into our own work when we go into the different spaces as adults. So it, it's common, I'm sure many people will agree that are visiting here with us tonight, that um, we have to check ourselves. We absolutely mm -hmm. check ourselves. Yeah. So I'm glad that you brought that up to conferences. Childcare, very part of, very important part of it too. Okay, we have yeah. questions. Um, okay. Oh, I, I, I love this. Okay, so there's two ooh, more. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about um, your research, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm dark um has it changed your mindset how you look at life has it changed it or impacted it in any way I think so um I'm laughing because I I just talked to a friend last week and I'm talking I'm working with her on a different thing on campus so she did she didn't know about my research she knew what I teach but not what I research right and then I shared something like, oh, I have a paper due on this. And I, I told her what it was. And her face was like, you researched that? And I said, yes. And she goes, you're always so happy and so cheerful. And your energy is always great. And I'm like, well, I'm not crying all the time. I do cry sometimes when I'm working on this. But I don't cry all the time. So it has changed my mindset. But I think it has made my research matter. 
because I saw a lot of my classmates, not that it's wrong, but I saw a lot of them just saying, I'm going to research uh, 16th century poetry because it's beautiful. Or I'm going to work on this author because it's the best author out there, right? No really personal connection to this topic. And uh, working with undergrad students as my research assistants, one of them told me, this is personal to us. Like we don't take this lightly. We don't separate ourselves from it, but that helps our research as well. So now I embrace being connected to the research in a personal level, because as a Mexican woman, I do feel identified with many of the women, right? And I, 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 I use this to my advantage. And I always say when I write about this, this is something that's personal to me. And this is how that helped me look at this in a different way. The personal is political. You know, it always is. Mm -hmm. always is yes. Um, okay. So how did being undocumented impact your education journey? A lot. Um, actually, I, this is like, Los secretos van a salir. Um, I didn't want to go to Long Beach State. Long Beach State was not my first option. I wanted to go to a private university in LA that was very fancy and expensive. And I did get in and we went to the open house. And then my mom was like, I'm glad we brought you, but we cannot pay for this. Because, <laughs> you know, back then we didn't have DACA. We didn't have A540. So everything came out of pocket from my parents pocket because I didn't work back then either so I had to go for the cheapest option in that case which was Long Beach State but then I'm so thankful because Long Beach became my home away from home like I used to hang out at the Chicano Studies Department all the time as you know just like mm -hmm. hanging there in the office eating lunch talking to the profs um, like I mean you were at my wedding you officiated my wedding so it, it became so important to my life and to who I am right now that I think I was just meant to be there um, so I think at first I was sad that I didn't go to the university that I wanted to be at, um, that my legal status put me somewhere else, but then I think I was put where I was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, life, ha li life does that to you. Life does that to you. I have, you know, I think as uh high schoolers, I had a similar feeling like this would be my first choice. It would be my second choice. And, um, the one that I ended up going to was not even a choice because I'm like, there's no way that this is ever going to happen. Like, there's no way that I'm ever going to be accepted into the school. And then I was, and I was like, yeah. what is actually going to happen? And then I was like, I guess this is my first choice, right? It happens. Life, life gives you the, these opportunities. Um, and I have to say that I think your time as an uh, undocumented student at Long Beach State, there was a lot of activism. Oh yeah, and I was there. I have the pictures yes. of the newspaper because I was there marching. Yes, <laughs> and so the, the, I, I really want to say that there was a very, very special cohort yeah. at that time at Long Beach State, and many of you have made national, international impact with the work that you're doing. Artists, right? Mm -hmm. Writers, publishers. I mean, that was a pretty rock star cohort right there of, of, of the work that you're doing. Um, I'm so proud of all of you. Um, okay, so there are more kind of education related questions. Mm -hmm. How do you manage taking care of yourself? Oh, this is great. I talk to students all the time about time management, right? How do you manage? I love time management. <laughs> yes, she does. She's the mark. Do you still handwrite markers, stickers, all that stuff? Oh, yeah. But yeah. Did you remember my color coding planner yes, that I had all over that? Yes. <laughs> So I um I like the sense of being on being in control of my time, even if things happened. Mm -hmm. So I love planners. I love color coding and planning my time. Uh, now what I do, I didn't do it back then. I wish I had done it more during my my studies at all levels. Uh, what I do now as a professor, like I have a work schedule. Like after five thirty p.m., the latest, unless I really have to, I don't work. I close my computer and I have my evening with my family, right? Weekends, I try not to work. Sometimes it's inevitable because, you know, we have a lot of meetings that we weren't expecting to have. And that takes time away from your, from your work. But that to me, that's, that's my care, just keeping work as work and not as my life. Uh, but it took me a while to get to that space of seeing work just as work. And I think for me, work is, you know, anything like my master's, my PhD, anything will be work for me. You know, um, 
there's just like you figure out routines for things or what I always say, find your writing style, find what makes you comfortable when writing. You're going to have to try out a few planners or a few tools and a few apps, you know, and then the, there's going to be the one that just clicks in with you and it's going to help you organize. It is a lot of work. I want to acknowledge uh, Cynthia. Yeah. It is a lot of work, um, but you have to find that system that works for you. And also it changes according to how your life changes. So what worked for me when I was breastfeeding and finishing a dissertation does not work for me now because my life is completely different. So always be looking for new things that are going to help you do what you want to do. I'm also more like, um, I don't try to do everything anymore. You know, some things I'm like, that's not going to happen. And it just, it doesn't happen and it's fine. Life goes on. Life does go on. But there is something quite beautiful about being a young college student and having all the energy to do a lot. Oh, yeah. So take advantage of it. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> take advantage of it, everybody. Um, all right. There's another question about Mexico and mm -hmm. uh, and and its uh, judicial system, right? Mm -hmm. And its power. Would you say that over the years it has improved? Have many cases been solved? It's complicated. It's it's very complicated because a lot of times it's um it depends not only on the state and the city, it depends like where it happened, right? Um, what I what I can say is we do have a law in Mexico that declares feminicidios as feminicidios, and you have I think it's seven different things that will make something as a feminicidio. So if any of those one things happen in the murder of a woman, then it's a feminicidio. However, not many get investigated as such, even when you have one of those seven requirements, because, you know, corruption or people are just overwhelmed with cases, et cetera. Uh, so it's, it's really complicated. Sometimes it does work, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I know that the mujeres that are out there fighting for the case of feminicidio are trying to make the judicial system work for them. And sometimes that's hard, but a lot of times it helps that you go on social media and then your case becomes viral and then they're like pressured to do something about it. So it all depends. It's it's really complicated. Um, I hope it gets better with time. I hope that the mujeres get louder and louder and louder and let them know that they're not gonna back down until something actually happens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, um, the community support, the community um, pressure um, does move the needle a little bit. It may yeah. not be a large step, but that has changed over the years. That could be social media. That could be political organizing in Mexico. A little needle movement is is makes a big difference. I mean, it, since, since you teach, teach literature, um, there is a wonderful book by Cristina Rivera Garza. It's called Eliana's Invincible Summer. And it's about her sister who was murdered in the 90s. So mm -hmm. she comes back to that murder of her sister. Now that we have the language to call it feminicidio, we have the law to back up that term as well. So she revisits the, the murder of her sister, but also goes back to the course and says, now that we have the language, what can you do about it? So it's very powerful. Yeah, if you can put the title there, that'd be great. Yes. Um, and so, um, okay, we have some last two questions of the uh -huh. evening. And then everyone, after these two questions, we invite you to join us um, for what's called the Sobre Mesa. Um, and it's a continuation, a very informal continuation of the program. Um, and if you, you may not know the word Sobre Mesa, it's just a little chatting time, chatting time. Um, okay. so. There, um, someone here is a student and a parent. Um, any mm -hmm. resources that you can share on parenting Latino students um, to find my voice and myself on campus? Any tips? Any resources mm -hmm. that you can share on parenting Latino students? I don't know if you're in Long Beach. Um, Long Beach State does have a parenting student support group. So I will say the first thing is just go to your university and see what they have. And when they don't, um, there are networks out there to help you and to support you. So there is one called Pregnant Color. 
I think it's pregnancycolor.org. Uh, I'm not sure if it's that org or that com. But if you, if you Google that, it'll come up. Um, mm -hmm. It's not only for pregnant uh, people, but it tells you about your rights as a parenting student. So for example, now all the CSUs by law are supposed to offer parenting students priority registration and parking. Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting that and you're a CSU student by law, you are supposed to get that. So ask, right? And make someone do their job. Uh, but that website is great to tell you the laws that you have, you know, to rely on. And also that you are a protected class under Title IX for many things. Mm -hmm. So just knowing your rights, it's very important to start advocating for yourself, I think. Okay. Um, on the flip side, I just want to ask you, I'm wondering, um, are there any sources that you know or books that you know since I know you you read a lot you love reading you know a lot of books um that maybe students can share with their parents on parenting like someone who's going through college or or um ways to help that's, that's a good one it's I I'm, I cannot think of one okay, we, need, we need to figure this one out yeah yeah so to share with their parents about like the first gen experience and everything. That it's yeah, the audience is the parent. Yeah. Not... Hmm. yeah. Maybe just... maybe that book needs to be written by, yes. by someone. Yes. <laughs> no, and uh, that's a great one because you know we're we're not just first gen students, we're first gen familias. So our parents are going through the through the whole thing for the first time as well. Yeah. Um uh, one, one, another essay I assign in class is taking my parents to college. Mm. Uh, and, uh, it's a wonderful essay and the family goes through orientation, not knowing that it was only for the student. They thought it was for the family because you do things in familia, right? Yes, I know. It's such a great essay. I love that essay. Okay. Um, last question. How would you do your research? Um, oh, this, thank you, uh, Hinato. Um, where do you do your research? How do you find these sources? Um, also, how do you find out ways to share your ideas if you if you did without the internet? Oh, well, we had old school research uh, tools then. Old school research. <laughs> um, so so my, my first project, as I mentioned, is on the 1968 sort of massacre in Mexico City. And of course, like I'm a literature scholar, so I went to the books first and see what was out there published. But then I also did field work, which is not common in my field, but I wanted to be at the plaza where it happened. I wanted to talk to people. I wanted to just get to know the area. And I got funding for one summer as a grad student, PhD student. And my first week was just me sitting at the Tlalco Plaza where the massacre happened for hours at a time. And then people start to notice, right, that you're always there sitting down. So the street vendors came over and say, hi, what are you doing? And I would go like, I'm researching the massacre. Oh, you know what? My cousin was there. What, let me give you her phone number so you can go and talk to her. And next thing you know, I had an entire like list of people from like street vendors to politicians in Mexico that someone gave me their number and connected me to. And now I have like a whole network of people that help me with my research. Wow. At, from That's all ages, all backgrounds. Being in La, in La Plaza. Just from being in La Plaza. Mm -hmm. um, and they will invite me like, oh, did you know Elena Poniatosca, the writer, has an event at her foundation this weekend? I'm like, no, I'm going to be there. And then you get to know people there and you talk and... I got a lot of my connections in Mexico City thanks to those like events of, you know, just people randomly. An Uber driver told me that her, her brother was in prison. So then I talked to the brother on the phone. It was, it's the most random thing, but people are always willing to share their stories if you're willing to hear. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. How do, how do students tackle the library stacks these days? What do you think? How should they go and... I, I love just going to a library and being there for hours. <laughs> um, I'm someone that will like look for one book and then go and, and, and go through the entire shelf and see what else I can find. And I think that's how research maybe should start at the library, looking at what has been done and what you can contribute with your new thoughts and ideas, right? Um, so I'm always like the one that goes to the library and gets like the entire shelf of the one topic and just checks everything out. Um, I have been guilty of like 
taking over our entire shelf. I'm sorry about that for people that were looking for those books. <laughs> <laughs> is there um is there a collection, an archive collection about the massacre? Are there it's it's complicated again. I was in Mexico City last summer because a writer that I that I write about that I research about um, left the box before his death by suicide. He died by suicide on October second, the anniversary of the massacre in 2016, and he left the box with his manuscript that he wrote in prison um, after the massacre and letters and photos. And I went to the archives just for that box, and I got through all the different stages. And when I got to the last one where you go and ask for the documents, um, the guy left and came back an hour later and he said, I can't find the box. Um, and then I said, well, I'm coming from the US, could you really like look for this box? Like I'm only here for that one box. He left again, came back and said, they told me to tell you that it's lost. And then I said, what do you mean? And he's, I'm so sorry. That's I don't have the power to do anything else. So there are some things that are available. There are some things that you can go and look at. There's a museum now that you can visit and they have tons of resources, but at the same time, they have so many other things that are still hidden, right? So mm -hmm. the silences are just as strong as what's out there. Okay, all right, wow. Um, is there, I'm gonna invite our staff, our partners, our colegas from the Museum of Latin American Art to, to join us now, but is there a traveling exhibition from this collection? Has one been built that you know of? Mm -mm. Mm, interesting, interesting. No. I think with, um, with Ayotzinapa, we saw a lot of exhibitions on Ayotzinapa here in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of brought, I will say the topic of the disappearances to a more international audience. Right. Um, but not specifically the 68 massacre. Okay. All right. Maricela, it's been a pleasure. Un placer. So wonderful to spend some time with you, just like old times, chatting up. Just like old times, yes. yes. Um, <laughs> Solimar, welcome to, back to the conversation. Thank you. It's been a fascinating conversation. And I really want to dig in a little bit deeper with you and maybe offline. Um regarding the latine latinx latino latina and that conversation because it's an ongoing situation and i agree with you 100 percent. the language is always alive and it's always going to be changing so we can't we can't tie ourselves down to something now because next month it may be something different um and on that note i want to thank everybody that's been here with us for this great session as we get started on Latinx Heritage Month, now the use of the X, um, and a, we start celebrating with everything that um, we have planned throughout Long Beach for just to highlight and celebrate Latinos, Latinas, Latine, Latinx community members. Um, hope you join not just MOLA, but everybody else that's doing something during this upcoming month and throughout the year as well. Because we are who we are 365 days a year, not just 30. And that's a personal soapbox. With that, have a great night, everybody. Thank you very much. And if you want to stay for the soda mesa, you're more than welcome. <laughs>